Hello everyone, and welcome to the sixth lecture of the second edition of the Current Topics in Heritage Science series of the Iperion HS Academy. This series is organized by the emerging professionals in the frame of the Iperion HS project and the European Research Infrastructure of Heritage Science. My name is Diego Quintero Balbaz, and I am, I am a researcher at the National Institute of Optics in Florence, and I'll be moderating today's lecture. Our topic today is dendrochronology, tree, rings, art, and archaeology. The recording of this lecture will be available later on the Medius YouTube channel. At the end of the lecture, you will receive a survey. Please take a few seconds to let us know your opinion about this, uh, this series. You can ask questions through the Q&A function at the bottom bar of the Zoom window. And if you are experiencing some uh, technical difficulties, you can contact us using the chat. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce two, our two speakers, Dr. Pascal Treture and Dr. Banson Laba. Uh, Dr. Pascal is the head of the Dendrochronology Laboratory at the Royal Institute of Cultural Heritage in Brussels since 2003. She is an archaeologist and art historian specialized in the dendroarchaeology applied to panel paintings from the 15th to 17th century and sculptors. She has developed these specificities in interdisciplinary research projects and for scientific services, and is regularly commissioned by a Belgian and abroad institutions. Her research in dendrodating, dendroarchaeology, dendroprovenancing, as well as methodological, methodological developments have led her to promote the FED twin project, Deeping Heritage, in collaboration with the University of Liège and financed, uh, financed, financed by the Belgian Science Policy Belspop. Dr. Vincent has studied vernacular construction in the Alps and in close relation with forestry through building archaeology and dendrochronology at the University of Marseille. This field of expertise led him to develop the relationship between resources, forest, and consumption areas on sound Western European mountain with water scale, particularly in French Pyrenees at the University of Toulouse. He then joined the ANR uh, Bedins project from the CNRs, CNRS uh, to study the ancient bench fir forest past trajectories using dendro archaeology. Currently, he is engaged full time in the FED twin project Keeping Heritage to, res to resolve its issues. Thank you both for being here today. Uh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you for in, in the introduction, uh, Diego, and to the HS Academy organizers for inviting us for this lecture. So as an introduction, let's start by introducing ourselves in quite word because you just did it now. So I had <clears throat> a master a master degree in archaeology and art history at the University of Liège, Belgium, where uh, there was one of the most active dendro archaeological lab directed by Professor Patrick of Sumer. And there I got fundings for a PhD to develop methodologies and techniques for improving dendro study of paintings. I focused on Southern Netherlandish paintings, so more or less present day Belgium, from 15th to 17th centuries. And this ongoing work gave me the opportunity to be engaged in 2003 to, um, at the Royal Institute for Cultural Heritage, the Kikirpa in Brussels. So this is a Belgian scientific federal institution in charge of the documentation, study and preservation of the Belgian cultural heritage. So in that, in that context, I've had the opportunity to pursue my research on panel paintings and also to develop it on sculptures in close collaboration uh, with colleagues of different disciplines, leading then to real multi and interdisciplinary studies. And see, since uh, 2011, the lab has developed and we are now six dendro archaeologists of whom Vincent who speak with me today and this enlargement of the team has extended our fields of uh, expertise not longer 
to works of art, but also to buildings and archaeological remains. And now I will introduce you Vincent in some words. So as part of his PhD thesis, defended in uh, 2016 at Ex Marseille University, Vincent studied mountain construction in the Alps and uh, in uh, its relationship with forestry using building archaeology and dendrochronology. These fields of expertise led him to develop the relationship between resource forests and consumption areas in watershed scale, particularly in the French Pyrenees at the University of Toulouse. Then <clears throat> he joined the Bendis project to study the ancient beach for forest past trajectories using dendroarchaeology. Forestry practices, uses, and, and provenance are the key issues in current dendroarchaeological research. And Vincent is currently engaged full time in the Fetrin project Deep in Heritage to resolve these issues. So, what we will uh, talk about today are first the main principles of dendro uh, chronology, the methods for recording and dating tree rings, so how we work on cultural heritage objects the precision degrees of dating and provenancing, so what are the benefits of dendro analysis, but also its limitations when working with heritage objects. And then I will add the floor to Vincent to present the potentials of the discipline, in particular for timber provenance and exploitation practices. So to begin by the beginning, uh, and the origin of the word dendrochronology uh, comes from the Greek term dendron, tree, chronos, time, and logos, science. So dendrochronology is the discipline, the discipline that studies the annual growth rings of the trees. So in growth rings, different parameters can be studied then can be used in different sub-disciplines. Uh, and in, in all these sub-disciplines, more specifically, dendroarchaeology groups different methods to determine the period during which a tree was felt, shaped, and used for the construction of an object, and to determine the geographical region with, when the tree grew. So to achieve this goal, the main component that will be studied is the, in dendroarchaeology will be the width of the rings. So as far as an object is in, is in wood, sorry, it can be studied by dendrochronology. So the application of dendro to cultural heritage is quite wide as what was one of the most used material for building structures paintings, sculptures, furniture, musical instruments, and so on. For the basic principle for dating by tree rings, so here we are speaking about trees growing in temperate climate, such, an, such as in Western Europe, with con, con, sorry, <laughs> contrasted vegetation seasons. So in such contexts, a tree, such as oak, uh, as on this example, produces one ring each year on the periphery of the trunk. So the oldest rings are near the pith, in the center of the trunk, and the most recent are just under the back. And as you can see on this, on this detail of the transverse section of an oak tree, uh, all rings do not have the same width. And this is because if there are many factors that influence the growth of the tree, the most important is the climate. If the climate is ideal for the tree, so enough light, enough water, the tree will produce a lot of food. 
and thus a wide ring. But if the climate is more stressing, a very dry year, for example, the tree will not grow as much, giving a narrow ring. So as the climate does not replicate from one year to the other, each ring width is different from the previous one. The measurement of the rings will give us a sequence, which is thus unique in time, because the climate changes every year and does, does not reproduce cyclically. So this ring width series uh, is thus entirely comparable to a barcode of the life of the tree, unique and typical of the period during which a tree grew. Practically, we will transfor transform measurements in such graphs with in abscissa the time scale, so the years, and in ordinate the width of each year. So a high point is a wide year and a point down on our ring. And uh, these graphs will, will be uh, then compared uh, with specific mathematical tests and uh, softwares to reference chronologies built for each species and from each region. And once the sample or its barcode has been placed on the reference, the timelines of the trees known. So now we'll see by some case studies how to interpret this dating, but first how to sample cultural heritage objects. So on deciduous trees, recording tree ring widths needs to have access to the transverse section of the tree. From beams in buildings, we will use a bore to take a core. The core must be oriented from the periphery to the piece of the beam. And here we are the resulting sample with the internal part of the tree here, the piece, and the external bar, uh, part, uh, the bark. So from this case study of a building in Liège, we will explore the dating results we can get in order to understand the chronology of the construction of a building. So the archaeological study of the roof frame, and in particular, the assembly marks on the beams, reveals three different phases in this roof. So we took samples to cover the three zones. We me measured uh, the samples in the lab to obtain the uh, dendrochronological series. <clears throat> These were then compared to each other and dated against reference chronologies. And here is what we call a bar diagram which represents the length of the, um, and the chronological position of all the samples. This graph with different colors for the different zones shows that they are partially contemporary, but now we will, <clears throat> sorry, we still have to interpret these dating results. And for that, to go deeper in the samples, in particular, to study the anatomy of the last rings we have on each of them. So if the sample preserves the bark or the bark age, the last ring of the samples corresponds to the last year of the life of the tree. The date of this ring corresponds thus to the year of its felling. If the sample preserves, sorry, if we do not have the bark, but some separate rings on the samples, we can estimate the felling within a range of dates, thanks to statistics from trees of the same region and of the same species. Last and worst possibility, we have neither the bark nor the sapwood. In this case, we cannot know the number of rings missing until the bark, and thus, until the year of felling. We then obtain what we can call a terminus postquem for the felling, 
that is a year after which the tree was felled. So coming back to our roof frame, confronting uh, archaeological and dendro results shows the chronology of the roof constructions in three different phases. All are dated in the first uh, third of the 15th century, but with a stop between zone one, one and one, two of 10 to 15 years between fellings and a stop of uh, between three to eight years between zone one, two and two with the, constru with the construction done from uh, east to west. So let's move to a second example, a painting. A painting we have chosen because this is one of the most important for the 15th century Flemish production, the adoration of the mystic lamp by the Van Eyck brothers. In such analysis, it is clear that sampling by Bohr is not allowed. Therefore, we have to adapt our method for recording the ring widths without sampling. And fortunately, you will see it's possible. So for wooden panel support of the 15th century, planks were cut by splitting in a radial way. The transverse section of the wood is thus accessible on the edges of the plank. So accessible once the panel is removed from its frame. To make, to make the rings clearly visible, we clean the edges of the planks softly with a brush and record the ring series by macro photos that will serve as samples to be then measured. <clears throat> For the mystic lamp, I will not go into details uh, about its technical art historical issues. I would just refer to uh, the Closer to Van Eyck website to follow its current study and restoration treatment. The aim of uh, this example is mostly to show how important it is to analyze a maximum of wooden elements to be the most relevant in the result that Rocknology can bring. And the mystic lamp is crucial in this respect as one of its, you know, uh, its numerous questionings concerns its uh, genesis. In short word, was the art piece conceived as a whole project or does it result from a combination of several works? In this case, dating was of course of great interest, but as you can see on this slide, all blanks could be dated, but the resulted bar diagram gave, uh, gives quite similar dating results. So no mean by dendro chronology to construct a chronology within the altarpiece. But uh, on the contrary, more interesting was to compare the series of the planks to determine if they come or not from the same tree. This information can be obtained uh, by different ways, such as calculations or uh, visual comparisons, uh, comparisons of the wood itself, and by comparisons of the drawing of the dendro series. So in this example, you can see that we have here two uh, ring series, almost similar, almost identical, meaning that they come from the same tree. But in this second case, uh, the series are quite similar, but not enough to be sure that the planks came from the same tree or from neighboring trees. So as the results for the altarpiece, where one color represents plank from a single tree, if you study it in details, you'll see that these results clearly demonstrate that all parts of the work were supplied by common lots of timber, which demonstrates a unique original project, at least in terms of wood procurement. The next 
the next example concerns sculptures. So here, to access the tree ring widths, it is theoretically easy. The rings are just there on the base of the sculpture. So here again, we just clean softly the base of the sculpture and take macro, macro photo to be uh, then recorded on the screen. But in some cases, things are more difficult as in these pieces where the bases are quite degraded. So we try to develop new recording techniques such as tomography, so 3D X-rays. We tried it, uh, this in hospital equipment, but the devices do not allow enough resolution for dendrochronology. Fortunately, other devices are available, available to work on wood issues, such as uh, at the University of Ghent, where we test this recording of a book binding. And you can see on these images are clear uh, uh, how the images are clear uh, and impressive to give us the possibility to choose in every part of the wood where are the best locations uh, to record three rings. So, uh, and tomography is also very useful for many other aspects in cultural heritage, such as for conservation purposes or to better understand internally how a work was built. So coming back to dating purposes of the sculptures, most of the time, no sapwood is preserved because it, degrade, it degrades uh, rapidly. So the craftsmen needed to remove it and it is difficult to know how many rings are lost until the bark. So we never find the bark age and thus not a precision, a precision of the felling date to the year. And sandwood uh, remain are uh, rare. So in most of the case, we thus obtain just a terminus postgram for felling. However, in some cases, we find some sapwood remnants, such as on the widest parts of a statue, the filling period can thus be more precise. But the question remaining is, after the filling, when the tree was used and sculpted, when the roof frame was built, or when the panels were painted. For buildings, things are quite simple. Indeed, for most of the building, for which archival or archaeological data can be compared to dendro results, we could prove that the year of construction corresponds to the year or the season just after which the trees were felled. So if we have the felling year of the tree, we have the construction date. For sculptures, we have now more and more evidence going to the same way that is a use of the wood quite rapidly after felling. On the one hand, some sculptures show drying cracks appeared after the statue was sculpted. On the other hand, we now have uh, some examples dated by archives and or an inscription on the sculpture itself, showing a short, even very short interval be between the dendro results and the completion date of the work. And th this was the case of this altar piece. We know the commission date, 1490, and the date of its achievement, sculpted in the wood, 1493. And the last measured ring is dated 1489. Trees was, were then probably uh, felt just after the commission and used within the three following years. It must be said that the wood is softer when it is still fresh. It is thus logical that artists prefer sculpting the wood soon after the felling instead of uh, after a long drain time. For paintings, things are more complex because for such panels, the wood had to be dried 
not to shrink or move after its construction. But we have to remind that the wood used for panel, panels was obtained by splitting, at least until the 16th century, and that splitting is also easier when the wood is rather fresh. So it had to be split quite rapidly after felling. The planks were then dried, but the time period needed for drying planks is shorter than for a whole log. One year can be sufficient for planks until five centimeters of thickness. So for the mystic lamp, <clears throat> we could conclude to a felling of the trees in the range of uh, 1417 and 1432 because of a few sapotrings remnants. And the recent uh, study during the conservation restoration treatment reveals an original inscription on the frames uh, indicating that the altarpiece was ready to be shown in 1432 precisely. So even in this case, in which very few sapotrings were preserved, the general dating range includes the making of the panels and the painting process until its completion. So before, before letting the floor to Vincent, I would just mention that other species than O can be studied, such as bees, beach that can be recorded on slices as from the boards of uh, this coffin, or for softwood, by scanning on X-ray the flat side of the sandboard of a cello or a violin, for example. So as you've seen, in each case, the recording method is to be adapted to the object and to the anatomic specificities of the tree species. Moreover, of course, today the wood, we, we need reference chronologies for the different species, as well as from the provenance region, as the climate varies from a region to another. Now, please, Vincent, we are listening to you. Thank you, Pascal. So the violin presented just now by Pascal allows, us, allows me to take up another example from a study conducted by Patrick Gassman, a Swiss Denver chronologist. In this case, the study established the link between violins made in England at the beginning of the 19th century and mountain houses built in Switzerland in the middle of the 18th century. During this period, Gruyere cheeses were exported from Switzerland to several destinations, including London. These cheeses were stored in spruce barrels, and this wood could be reused to make violins in London or Paris workshops, for example. This study, which made it possible to date the violin, the violin you see above left, also led to the discovery that the spruce wood could have come from a particular valley in western Switzerland. The example we have just seen uh, uses that uh, what might might call uh, classic dendro provenance. Pascal presented a few examples. This method is based on climate influence, on tree-ring growth, and on statistical values between chronologies. What we have seen is that it works with determining provenance on a fairly large scale, but requires representative geographical coverage to avoid any bias. On a smaller scale, and when reference chronologies are lacking, this classic dendro provenance is often irrelevant. With this in mind, a number of researchers and research teams are developing new approaches to unlock the origins, the origin of importing timber. Today, commercial timber is transported over great distances, which we know often leads to problems linked to the forestry regulation in certain areas and also to the raw material traceability. Some of these issues echo past context. In the example shown on the screen, François Blondel conducted research on wooden mummy labels in Roman Egypt. By identifying the, the species used to make these labels and mapping the tree species distribution in the Roman Empire, this research showed that they were imported from all over the Mediterranean basin. Stable isotope studies 
that are not radioactive isotopes is used in many fields, including archaeology. Certain elements, such as transform, are studied spe specifically because they provide a geological signature and, by extension, help to pinpoint the provenance and archaeological of archaeological woods. Trees fix some of the chemical elements contained in the soil. However, researchers have noted that in certain cases, such as prolonged immersion in water, the strontium in the soil can gradually be replaced by that in the water, which disturbs the stagnant. In addition, as with tree ring chronologies, this approach requires the establishment of extensive reference frames. As with the isotope analysis development, advances in genetics have led to some archaeological wood traceability application. For example, a study carried out in the Baltic Sea area has enabled trees groups to be characterized according to certain DNA characteristics. At left, researchers combine tree ring growth, anatomy, and strontium isotopes to unravel ancient timber supply on a small scale around the city of Limoges in France. In the center of the stream, researchers have combined tree ring growth with wood density, and the aim of this study was to be able to differentiate timber origin by taking altitude into account. In this other example, the research concerned concern a framework dangerous archaeological study, study on a former hospital in Toulouse in southwestern France. The research was carried out combining archaeological sources, written, written, written records, and dendro chronology. Dendro chronological dating provides, provides dates ranging from the 17th to the 19th century. On many timbers, we found hammer marks made by timber merchants before the timber were floated. We have this information because many transport documents have been preserved. The merchant's marks are also reproduced in the margins, enabling us to make matches and, in some cases, give a provenance indication. So we have to compare this result with a classic dendro provenance approach. Human societies interact with forest ecosystems transforming or adapting them according to their needs. While the supply sources and the materials used reflect the state and availability of wood resource, trees also react to the transformation brought about by human societies. In many cases, these reactions, adaptations, are recorded in tree rings and can be analyzed using dendrochronology. Like provenance, the question of forest management practices is a current issue since covered three main areas, economic, environmental, and climatic. However, it's clear that in order to ensure the long-term survival of forests while exploiting them, it's necessary to adopt specific management methods and by extension, specific exploitation practices. Researchers have shown that exploitation practices were used by past societies while Written records show, for example, that coppicing practices have existed since at least the Middle Ages. Bioarchaeological sources reveal logging practices that go back even further, to the Middle Ages in particular. The examples shown on the screen refer to a type of growth disturbance known as growth release, which is characterized characterized by an abrupt growth change following a forest opening up. This disturbance can be natural following a storm, for example, but can also be man-made. In this case, the disturbance cyclical aspect can refer to a frequent harvesting of certain trees while the other trees are left to develop. The two examples on the stream come from two different contexts. On the left of the study of timbers from the archaeological excavation of an aristocratic dwelling dated from the 10th to 11th centuries in the southwestern France, while on the right in the timber frame study held in an ancient abbey dating from the 16th and 17th century in southern Belgium. On the left, the authors indicate that during this period, the stand development of the exploited woodland presents a nature like here. The increasing building activity resulting in a massive felling of old oak trees. 
implies deep change in woodland dynamics with the introduction of coppicing. At right, a fairly similar process can be observed. We can also see that the timber fell during this second phase began growing immediately after the first phase quilting. Before concluding this presentation, during which we presented only some dendro archaeological application and research fields, we believe that linking provenance and exploitation practices can help to clarify the identity card on, of the land by associating climatic, soil, and human footprint. We wanted to add that our title, Dendrochronology, Trearings, Art, Archaeology, refers first and foremost to a conference that took place in Brussels in 2011, which summarized these different aspects of the discipline. He has also published a collective works, which you can find in the references section. At the end of this presentation, uh, it should be remembered that dendro archaeology requires precise recording methods adapted to each type of object and each type, each species of tree. Interpretation of the dendro chronological dating depends very much on the quality of the record and by extension, the quality of the archaeological remains. Both provenance studies and dating research require large data sets. And we know that the geographical coverage of these data vary from one region of the world to another. And we end this presentation by illustrating it with the last example from a house in Liège in Belgium. Here, the dendrochronological dating of the timber frame shows that it was fair between 1553 and 1557. This timber frame was covered with a painted plaster with a design that can be seen slightly in the photo in the center. And this dating enabled the archaeologists to link the paint covering the timber frame with a series of engravings published in Paris in 1556. Without going into too much detail, the main point here is to stress the importance of interdisciplinary dialogue, which is often essential if we are to make progress in understanding past societies and cultural heritage. Thank you again for this invitation and for your attention. Thank you so much for uh, the presentation. It was very interesting. And uh, before going to the question and answer session, I will present the next uh, uh, lecture that we will have on April 18. Uh, the presentation will be on digitalization of cultural heritage, HVAM and Open BIM HVAM by Katia uh, Malbert-Rebet. Uh, okay, thank you so much. <laughs>